to our monthly webinar. My name is Justin Cooper. I'm a hard money lender, full-time real estate investor, and coach and consultant to real estate investors. Each month, we bring in some of our friends in the industry to share their expertise. This may be through a presentation, like when we talk about self-directed IRAs or title insurance, or we may simply interview our expert friends and dive deep into how they got started, where their investing has taken them, and what they see coming for both themselves and for the industry. I want to say thank you to everybody who made it to tonight's event. We know you're giving up some of your valuable time, so Gray and I will do everything we can to bring the value that you're hoping for. This webinar is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial is Colorado and Minnesota's premier hard money lender. Pine focuses on the needs of Colorado and Minnesota real estate investors, and we're investors ourselves, and we know what it takes to get deals closed. Everyone at Pine Financial knows what it takes to get deals closed. I think I said that already, huh? <laughs> so we only experience success when our clients are succeeding. And we have a habit of telling you when a deal should or should not be done. And isn't that what you want from a professional in the industry, especially someone you trust as an advisor? You will benefit from our honesty and integrity when you choose to work with us. Now tonight's webinar brings in a new friend and property manager, Gray Hall. Gray is a team leader for GK Houses Colorado. Gray started out as a leasing agent with GK and now leads property management operations along the front range. Gray loves partnering with owners to manage their single family and small multifamily assets in Denver, Boulder, and Fort Collins. When not in the office, Gray enjoys skiing and camping with his wife, Erica. All right, Gray, I gave just a little bit about you. Why don't you dive in, give us a little bit more about who you are and why you're here tonight, and then we'll get into our conversation. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm originally from Alabama, and that's where I kind of got into this whole property management, real estate investing world. Um, so yeah, I work with GK Houses, and we are a property management company. Um, we got about 2,600 units you know, across the United States in about five different markets. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to be out here in Denver, Colorado. Not a better market to be in, uh, especially with the weather today. So um, yeah, like you said, I kind of got into this, uh, started as a leasing agent. Um, leasing just a number of houses uh, down there in Alabama. Um, kind of over the past couple of years, was able to run a number of different kind of positions to just kind of understand the business as a whole. Um, and really what our model is, is kind of, we're, we're, we got pretty big growth goals. So we're, we're trying to get to 25,000 managed houses uh, and we get into these new markets by acquiring existing businesses. So that's how we got out in Colorado. Um, we bought a business, uh, two bought businesses last year uh, and I moved out to kind of oversee the operations there. So. Um, yeah, it's been a fun journey to get out here. Excited to share a little content today about how to hire um, a property manager. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So so let's just back up for a second. And before we start diving too deep, just tell us what is property management? Let's start talking just about that, because obviously we talk about all kinds of different uh, investing here uh, on the webinar. Pine Financial yeah. is a hard money lender, lending money to investors. But tell us, give us a quick high level of what property management is before we get going. Yeah, it's probably the least sexy out of all of the investing, but uh, kind of the high level we solve is yeah, managing homes for investors. Um, so we will place tenants, we will advertise your house, uh, we will screen tenants, uh, put a lease in there, and then we manage after we put the tenant in there, we'll manage ongoing maintenance, um, we will manage any tenant requests um, yeah, throughout the year. So that's kind of the high level we do. We want to take that burden off of owners and use kind of our expertise to find the best tenants, uh, the quickest, um, manage maintenance to one, maintain the home, but two, keep tenants happy. Um, so that, yeah, overall there's lower vacancy and kind of high returns for owners. So just at a high level, that's what we do. We're just, we're solving all the problems for property owners, uh, and allowing them to either invest more or kind of do, you know, if they're, if they're just a part-time landlord, uh, allowing them still to have a full-time job and we, we take all the headaches off of their shoulders. Perfect. Got it. All right. So that's what property management is. Obviously, uh, you come in because a lot of investors, although they want the long-term wealth of rental properties, they don't necessarily want the headaches of the tenants and the toilets and that and that stuff. And that's where you guys would come in. And yeah. so, um, so what are some things we should be thinking about before we talk to a, a, a property manager? So obviously, if I don't want to, if I want that long-term wealth, but I'm scared or hesitant to manage tenants. Yeah. You know, these are things that are going through my mind as I'm thinking maybe I should entertain a property manager. But what are some other things that we should be thinking about before we even start, you know, looking for a, a PM? Yeah, that's totally rational to like, yeah, it is, it is an overwhelming process. You know, it's kind of this whole new world and this relationship you're managing, the home you're managing, that might be your first house. Um, kind of just understanding what your goals are. Um, are you looking to fill a gap in a short term? Um, 
or are you trying to build that long-term wealth? Are you needing a manager just in the interim while you kind of scale up your processes? Or are you really trying to build a team in a system, maybe while you're out of state, to manage everything? So it's just really important when you talk about scaling uh, personal investment, is having you know that portion of it offloaded. Um, so yeah, I think just kind of thinking through what your goals are. Do you want a manager who's going to be um, allow you to be hands off, or do you want a maybe smaller manager who you have to manage more? Do you want to be involved with it? Um, yeah, thinking through that kind of just like time horizons, like I was talking about. Um, you know, maybe you're living in the house and you're thinking about buying a second house. Is that six months out? You know, we can, we help people with that all the time, kind of transitioning into a second house and minimizing vacancy there. Um, but yeah, it, it may be property management not for you if you've got three months. It kind of got fulfilled. I, I think the best clients that we work with are long-term people who have a long-term view, who want to keep tenants in there for years at a time. That's where we can really help owners, owners succeed. Uh, and so I think that's what, if that is kind of what you're looking for, property management is probably for you. Uh, if you just don't have the time or don't have the knowledge um, to kind of manage all that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So we spent some time thinking about what our goals are and why, first off, we're investing in real estate and then two, how we want those investments to look. Do we want to manage it ourselves? Do we want somebody else to manage it? But then, okay, so we've got that at a certain level, some sort of basis. And and I think as we continue the conversation uh, tonight, we'll kind of be asking more questions to help people spend more time thinking about this up front. But all right, we've got some sort of basis. Where do we find property managers that we should be talking to? Yeah, um, first place I would is just referrals. Um, so I think as you kind of start to get into the investment community, or investing community, people love to refer. They love to tell you their horror stories or the success stories. So that's that would be where I would start. I would ask friends. Um, I would ask Justin. I would ask uh, your mortgage broker is a good place. So friends would be first. Other investors, uh, maybe your mortgage broker, loan officer are good places as well. Um, you know, if, if, especially if it's a referral, if somebody's willing to kind of stick their neck out for you, then that's probably, they probably have had a pretty good experience. Uh, and it's at least for something kind of exploring. Um, I love getting referrals in kind of every area of my life just because I trust you and you're kind of extending that trust on somebody else. So um, yeah, do that. Um, there's a couple other places, uh, NARPM. So that's the National Association of Residential Property Managers. It's kind of, it's like realtors or uh, association for, for property managers. And so, um, you know, you join, there's a code of ethics. And so there's a level of professionalism there. Um, so each a lot of different cities have their own chapter. And so maybe looking on their website, would be a good place. Um, bigger pockets could be one. I've seen people recommended it on there. That's a really good community. So asking for recommendations in cities and then kind of last place would be Google. Um, you know, Google is an interesting thing just because you can pay a lot of money for AdWords or, um, you know, there's, you know, might be a good property manager hidden in there on the third, fourth page and you might never find them. So probably referrals would, would just be the best place to start. Yeah. I, I love the idea of referrals and, you know, just about every place that I go that, um, especially when I'm there to talk and, and participate in real estate, there's real estate investor groups. So RIA's real estate investor associations, um, yeah meetup.com is full of different uh, real estate investing groups. Um, and you start going to some of these things. And I know at least here in Denver, uh, there's like one event almost every single night of the week, depending on what you're looking for. And so, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, most folks looking for a property manager aren't looking for something literally that day or the next day. And so you can kind of, you know, take your time looking for it and planning it. But yeah, I agree. Referrals yeah. are great. And they're going to some of these events and talking to folks. First off, there may be property managers as sponsors, but then also um, just talk to all the other investors there. Talk to the folks running the group and see who they might recommend because they probably have some relationships, uh, have heard horror stories, have talked to these investors and have uh, good input on folks. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You mentioned something I kind of want to hit on. It's just, yeah, this is a relationship game. I mean, just every business is, but property management, I mean, you want to build a good relationship because I mean, we are managing big assets for people, especially out in Colorado to some of these higher cost of living areas. Uh, and so you want you want to have a certain level of trust with them. And so, yeah, that's why referrals are great. But like you said, a lot of times you're looking three, six, eight months out and take time to build that relationship um, so that you can you could you don't want to change three, four. Times. It's just a headache to do that. And so you kind of want to make a good decision on the front end. So it's, you know, hire them really slowly um, and build that relationship over time. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, so we've got a, a list of a few that come recommended. We're feeling pretty confident about them. Maybe we've even gone after we've gotten the referral and gone and double check to see if they're a member of that, uh, was it NARPM, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, all right, 
we're setting up some conversations, whether they're phone uh, conversations, we're meeting them at a property, we're gonna go out for coffee. What do we say? What does that first conversation with the property manager look like to help us decide if this is gonna be the right fit? Yeah, um, man, I got a number of questions that we might throw in show notes or something. <laughs> one of these, but um, yeah, kind of just under, kind of hear their story. Um, you know, if it's a smaller company, you're probably gonna meet with the owner, um, so you can kind of hear how they got into it. They're likely an accidental landlord. It's just kind of how most people don't uh, grow up saying you want to be a property manager. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just kind of hear their story, understand where they come from, how long they've been doing it, um, and yeah, I will kind of get through. I just kind of got a, a list of questions we can. I, I would recommend people asking. Um, if you kind of talk through those, that's cool. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that's a great thing to do. Um, I know when I was looking at hiring a property manager, I had done exactly what we were talking about. I had reached out, who do I know, who do I trust, who's had good experiences or bad experiences, uh, and then how did you interview them? And so I put together a big old list myself of questions to ask. Um, and I like that because now I'm in control of the questions. And instead of just sitting there listening to someone's sales pitch, I've put together questions that I want to know answers to, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of what we're going to do now sure. is go over the questions, not just that we think other landlords uh, and investors should know, but also what are the important questions that um, property managers want their clients yeah. to know. Yeah. So I love that you've got a, a list of questions that we're going to go over. So yeah. what do you think? Where should we start? Um, kind of understand, and I would say price is not the most important thing. I mean, this is a big asset, so <laughs> that's a lot that's of times money like, they're, like, doing that. <laughs> they're like, Hey, how, how much are you? And you know, they're just it's just a price bidding war. And uh, you just be cautious of that. I mean, this is a big asset that you've got. This is a lot is riding on there, so somebody might be more expensive. Don't roll them out over the front end. That's just it's the first question you get. And when people hear their price, yeah, and then that's all they ask. It's, you know, we're probably not going to be the best fit if you're that price sensitive. So um, probably don't start with fees. You know, I appreciate when people don't start with fees and they kind of start with other stuff. So one thing would be understanding kind of how many properties they manage. Um, so there's kind of different, some levels of, of managers. So kind of just a high level. So you've got maybe the 50 to 100 unit um, person. So this is likely not their full-time job. They're probably just doing this on the side. They might have a portion of kind of their units that they manage. So it's just gonna be a less professional environment if they don't do it full time. Uh, they may or may not have an, uh, a property management software. Um, there's a lot of benefits that come with that. So I, I would recommend somebody because there's data that comes out of there. Um, it's really easy to manage. So, um, and things like owner portals and just kind of professional reports. So with a hundred unit, you, you get really high touch. You'd probably be one of their very few clients, um, but it would be kind of less professional, less systems processes. And then you get kind of the 300. That's what a lot of this industry is. It's the, the 300 unit, maybe 250 or 400. Um, a lot of times it's, it's just difficult to grow past that. Um, and so, yeah, 300 is where a lot of people kind of feel comfortable managing. So, yeah, that, you'll get a great level of service there. A lot of times it's kind of one person doing everything. So they are top to bottom. They're inspecting the unit. So they have a really high level of context for um, what is out of the unit because they talked to the tenant. They did the lease rule. They put the sign out in the yard. Uh, they call it in the work orders. And so they've got a lot of context. Um, so that, that can be a really great for, um, if, if that's what you're looking for, maybe they probably do have an accounting software that they're at, a property management software. Um, and they've, you know, probably got some systems and processes in place, but you know, on the, on the con of that, if you're doing everything, there might be some, you know, delayed communication, or if they go on vacation, the whole thing kind of stops. And so if, if there's not systems and processes, so if that's important to you, you kind of think through that. Um, one thing is like speed with leasing, you know, are they the ones leasing it? Do they have a system ask? So we'll kind of go into some leasing stuff, but yeah, at the high level, they're doing pretty much everything. And then you start to get in the bigger organizations, kind of the 500 plus. And that's when you start to have kind of multiple teams within the team managing. And so just understanding how they operate within there. So I would start just understanding kind of what bucket they fall into. Um, and then from there, just kind of understanding, yeah, how's my property going to be managed? Do I have one point of contact? Um, and yeah. what not yeah. one going, do. going back to the the size of the the company, I think that's also important. You know, before you even get to the coffee appointment, having yeah. a certain understanding of that size, because maybe we want the really really high touch uh, when it comes to managing our properties, or maybe we just were very systems and processes oriented, and I'm okay having three different points of contact. You know, one for accounting, one for the property management, one for maintenance, or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so that's part of the stuff that we would need to think of up front to maybe whittle down because if we talk to one of each of these different buckets, 
you know, yeah. radically different information that may not actually help us get any closer to that decision. So yeah. I think that's an awesome place to start. Just classifying the, you know, the the different levels potentially of or sizes of property management firms. I love that as a great place to start and to be thinking about. Uh, yeah, I mean that's, that's certainly a good thought. So yeah, the, some of the bigger group we're one of them. So I'm kind of speaking. You know, we got you know a couple about 2,600 units. We got about 700 in Colorado. So we're one of these. And so I, I kind of just have the most experience with this. But some of our other markets kind of operate within these smaller buckets. So I've got kind of some context throughout that. But um, yeah, with these bigger organizations, you're going to get a lot of systems and processes, really probably professional reporting. Maybe um, they're more apt to use technology. So using things like uh, automated showing, which is, you know, a lot of people in the industry use. And it's kind of come to the forefront the past couple of years and it's taken a while to adopt. Um, but and then the, kind of on the con side, you might get a little bit lower touch. I mean, that one person, that accountant is not also the one who did the property inspection and they didn't lease the property. So you lose a little bit of that context. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we're kind of speaking of broad brushes here. I mean, there's certainly 500 more companies that have one person who does everything and there's 300 companies that have, you know, buckets for each, but just kind of, that's what I've, my observation has been as the industry as a whole. Yeah, I love it. All right, yeah. so, so we've got a good idea. We know the goals that we want for a property manager. We know what size feels yeah. like it might be the right one. Um, mm -hmm. Whether we know it or not, maybe we do interview them uh, for different sizes, but at least we have a good idea of what we're getting into. Um, and then, and so we know probably uh, how hands-off or hands-on we want to be. And then, mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, it's something like you were talking about, relationships are huge. Um, yeah. And a big part of relationships is communication, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's probably one of the first things I would be thinking about is, is the communication. Yeah, it's number one on my list. Um, yeah, so just you really want to set clear expectations because this is where I see a lot of frustration or just kind of struggles uh, between, you know, property manager and owner. So, yeah, ask them questions. What is their typical response time on emails? Um, how do they prefer to be communicated with? You know, me personally, love emails. You know, I would love to be able to exchange emails. I don't necessarily always have my phone with me and or I'm on a phone call. And so kind of knowing that for yourself, but what do they prefer um, with phone calls, et cetera? Um, asking them what happens if there's an emergency? Are they able to contact somebody? Um, understanding weekend support, you know, uh, we're, you know, are they Monday through Friday business? Or are they full seven days a week? You know, how kind of, how do they operate? Um, you know, if they're Monday through Friday, that's how we are. As long as you have systems and processes that kind of handle the one-offs on weekends and nights, totally fine, um, but there's other organizations that are open seven days a week. So kind of just understanding what the expectation is on the front end is really helpful because if you're expecting a one hour time response, whenever you get signed up, you're gonna be severely disappointed if they have a 24 hour turnaround time. Uh, and that can just lead to some growing frustrations. And that's the last thing you want off the bat is to go through all this work, sign all the paperwork and get to your house, you know, and then you guys are on different pages, kind of different wavelengths. Um, yeah, totally. That. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great point. It's kind of the first thing you need to talk through. Um, are you going to have somebody's cell phone? Is it an office you call? Like what are, what are just the ways that you want to be communicated with? And that's where you can talk about, all right, do you have one point of contact who does everything? Do you have multiple points of contact? How do we get in touch with them, et cetera? Yeah. Huge, huge. Understanding how you guys are going to communicate, yeah. how often you're going to communicate, what the best channels are. Yeah. That, that's, that's huge. Cause yeah. right then and there within five minutes, conversation over you're all about email i'm all about phone calls we're not going to be a good fit there we That's go yeah out. yeah no <laughs> doubt so uh, yeah understanding is it is it me who's doing everything or do we have a team you know in place and other people are doing that so yeah super healthy just on the front end uh to be able to know that perfect okay yeah so if we're still feeling good we still want to yeah. hang out what's <laughs> the next thing we may want to be talking about Talk through, and it kind of depends on where you're at, but just understanding their leasing process. Usually that's the first place that we, you know, have a large interaction with the owner. That's kind of the first action steps that we take. Um, you know, it's, it's more rare that people bring over occupied houses, although it does happen. So likely this is your first property, you close on it, you're super excited. You want to get it filled because you want to start covering that mortgage and start making some money. So um, yeah, talk to them through their leasing process. Uh, it's probably a healthy place just to ask about their, their, their fees on there. Um, we'll kind of touch on that later, but talk through leasing fees, understand what do they do to market the property? Where are they marketing it? Uh, most days it's, it's pretty much all online. Um, there's a couple different avenues that you would want to make sure that they're, they're marketing through, but pretty much anybody these days is going to be putting on Zillow. They're going to put it on Zumper, Facebook marketplace, Zumper syndicates there. Um, you could ask if they put it on the multiple listing service, the, the MLS, some property managers do. 
um, and some do not. Um, there's kind of some pros and cons to that, but asking you know, where are they marketing it and then kind of asking them, um, all right, how are you communicating with uh, prospective tenants? How are you setting up showings? You have, um, yeah, are you, do you have self-showing lot boxes out there or do you have a real estate agent who is kind of guiding them through the house? And you know, which, which of those two, because um, you might not be comfortable with uh, somebody going in with a lot box unaccompanied. Um, and, but you see, so you might want an agent. So just understanding on the front end, is there an option between that? Do they have a choice? Um, or is it kind of get, leave it or take it on that front? Um, and on that, it's like, so we started using self-showing on a lot of our vacant properties and we've seen really high success rates. So we are collecting, um, this is, we use Rently and there's other ones, Tenant Turner and um, a couple of other ones out there, but you collect a, a photo ID and there's a credit card information. So it's, it's relatively safe, but it just allows tenants to not have a scheduling conflict to that traditional scheduling with real estate agents. So um, that's the pro on it. The con is that they're not a company and they're not having a real estate agent sell to them per se. Right. Uh, so just got to figure out a comfort level there. Um, and then understanding it's communication levels. So do they have a call center that takes all the calls? Is it somebody in the office? Um, just, just making sure that you're comfortable and making sure that they kind of are able to check all your boxes um, when it comes to leasing. So a good statistic to ask them is what's their average days on market. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I would be asking them. So that kind of, depending on how you measure it, is from when the tenant moves out to the next tenant's place. And so that's that's a number that is that needs to be very important to owners because vacancy is very expensive. Right. Um, so exactly. Break down the month to a daily amount, um, and if it takes them 90 days to lease every one of their houses, they're probably not doing their job very well. You know, some, some houses take that long, but at a high level, maybe you know 30 days um, would be just kind of like a, a mid range for given all circumstances, occupied, pre leasing, etc. That you'd want yeah. it to be under 30 days. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. So we understand kind of the leasing process, how we're showing the property. What about um, just getting comfortable with and understanding what we're looking for in a good tenant? Um, mm -hmm. How much, because there's certain fair housing rules around this, how much say does the landlord or the, or the investor have in that? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that's one of kind of the, it's not talked about a lot, but I think it's a big benefit to having a property manager. So it really does separate the property owner from all of the prospective renters. Um, and so I think that is a benefit because there are fair housing laws that you have to be educated on and there's local legislation that you need to be up to date on and you can get yourself in a lot of trouble very quickly and not doing anything necessarily wrong, but you might say the wrong thing. And so that, that is in you know, the benefit of having a property manager. So um, yeah, there are fair housing laws. You can't discriminate against protected classes. And so just all property managers will and should know these kind of information. Um, and so, yeah, that, kind of at a high level. So what we are looking at, is we've got approval criteria. And so we're checking their credit. We are checking their income to make sure it meets certain thresholds. Uh, we are checking their background record. Um, we are checking um, evictions record as well. So we want to make sure that they have been a good tenant, that they have paid on time, and then we're calling their previous landlord. So um, we will handle all of that and do all of that. And at least a really high success rate when you make sure that they're meeting each of these kind of predetermined criteria. And this is, I mean, this is where kind of property management is, is you know, made right here. If you place a good tenant, you will have a really good experience. They'll take care of the house and they'll pay your rent. But if you have a bad tenant, they're going to cost you 10 times longer than maybe any vacancy would cost you. So it, it really is important to make sure you're putting in quality tenants. And most property managers, this is just a big focus of theirs, um, is putting the most quality tenants because it's, it's less for me to manage when I put a good tenant in there. And so I, I am motivated to do that, but I also want the relationship with the owner to go well. And if the tenant pays rent on time, uh, you get less phone calls from the owner angry. Um, they you know, aren't kind of having their own financial struggles. So um, yeah, that, it's super important to take your time and make sure one, you're checking them against these things, but two, that we're going through the fair housing, that we're not discriminating against anybody, not that we, you know, but there's just things that you need to be aware of that you can and cannot say and can right. and cannot do. And so if you're just a property owner, it's easy to throw an ad up on Zillow, um, but just be aware that there are some legislation out there and there might be people who are intending to harm single property owners and kind of find find somebody who's discriminating against them. We hope not, but I'm sure that's right. exists. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's it's one of the big uh, one of the big reasons I chose to move some of my properties over to a property manager was I don't know all those rules and regulations and and certainly it's it's a moving target as well, right? And so yeah. 
one of those things among many reasons that I, I chose to move over was I'm not a great property manager and I don't know those rules. And so yeah, yeah have the professionals do it. What else should we be uh, asking? Um, yeah, so understanding kind of the leasing process, um, I, I'd probably just get a timeline. I would ask for a timeline. So let's say, you know, just kind of say, hey, let's say we move forward. What are the next steps here? What documents do I need to give you? Uh, uh -huh. What kind of insurance requirements do I need to give you? Um, what is the timeline that when do you expect to have my house on the market? When do you start expect to be a good showing? When do you expect to get at least? So I think that's probably just kind of along the lines of setting expectations, understanding what their process is. And you might have in your head, oh, you're going to walk out and we're going to go to the property right now, or you're going to go out there tomorrow, but it might take, you might have to get the agreement signed before. So I think just set, setting expectations, um, asking insurance requirements, you know, different management companies have different ones, but a lot of times they will have to be additionally insured on the insurance just to make sure that you're covered. Um, right. So kind of understanding, you know, that at a high level. Um, the next big thing I talk about is maintenance. So this is a, kind of a deal breaker for a lot of people. Um, and so if you don't, know how they operate or you're kind of not prepared for the, the prices uh it's going to be you know just a, a point of contention so kind of the questions i would ask is just how do they handle maintenance just kind of lob it up to them and see what they say yeah, um, throw a softball and, and let them kind of start running yeah, with it yeah just see what they ask um you know the big thing is do they have a limit so a lot of management companies will have a pre-approved limit so that you know we and the property owner would agree upon and that gives us the authority to go out and do any work up to that limit. So uh, the reasons for that is it allows speed of response to get things handled for the tenant. Uh, and we're also not having to, to, to call the owner for, you know, hey, can we go out and you know unclog the garbage disposal? It needs to be done, but I don't have to bother the owner with it if you're able to be hands off. So asking what that threshold is, some owners at some property management companies, it's 100, some it's $500. Um, and then asking, is that negotiable? So, you know, we'll negotiate that with owners based on number of properties, uh, location of the property, um, et cetera. Because just having an understanding because the what is frustrating is as a property owner, at the end of the month, you don't know what's going on, but you get a $500 hit and that automatically takes out your cash flow. So right. understanding how they, are they gonna call you for every single um, maintenance work order? And some management companies will do that and some won't, it's more time intensive to do that. Um, but that goes back to, yeah, is it a small shop that can do that? Is it a big shop that has a process for it? But yeah, asking that question, I think a lot of first time might kind of in the, in the initial part want to kind of be involved and get a feel for maintenance. And so it might be a benefit that they could call you on every single work order. That way you can start to budget in your mind what expenses you're going to have at the end of the month. Yeah. And, and that really goes back to the first thing we we're talking about, which was communication, right? Yeah. How yeah. will we communicate? Uh, because for me, one of the big things was, I, I didn't want to hear from my property manager. You know, we, we set that limit. Here's the budget. Just make it happen. I don't want to be called with everything, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, when I was interviewing one of the the folks I was uh, potentially going to hire and work with, it made it sound like I would get a call on every every work order. Every everything yeah. would be filtered through me and. I wasn't really interested in that. So, okay. the, I mean, <laughs> trust the property manager. Let yeah. them work to that limit and trust that they're doing what is in your best interest. I mean, we've got a fiduciary responsibility to owners to work in their best interest. Um, and so, yeah, allowing them to do that, I think, is a really good thing. Uh, it's just less phone calls that you get and, and kind of more free time, more hands off owners are able to be. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so what about um, when uh, the tenant moves out? Yeah, the, there might be some repairs and updates needed. So yeah. what, do, what do we need to be asking and thinking about there? Um, yeah, so when the vacancy is expensive just from, the, you know, at a minimum, you're probably going to have, you know, two, three days kind of at the maximum if, if there was a lot of repairs. So at all possible, you want to ask them about the, this kind of ties into it. But what's their process for renewing tenants? What are they, mm -hmm. how often are they reaching out? Because that's one way that you can keep just keeping tenants in houses, keeps owners happy, keeps tenants happy. It keeps the money flowing through. And so uh, you sort of make sure that they have a process for it. You understand their timing. When are they going to reach out to you? When should you know? Uh, and then how aggressive they're going to be with just trying to get these things renewed. So that's the key. Now, if they don't, tenants move, you know, they, they go buy houses. You know, they've got issues on their own. Whether you're the best property manager, property owner, and the house checks all the boxes, tenants are going to move out every couple of years. So, um, yeah, and understand that vacancy is expensive. So the tenant moves out, uh, you want to ask, are, you, are they going to do a move out inspection? Is there any cost for that move out inspection? 
Um, most, I don't think charge for that. I don't know any that really charge for that. We don't charge for it. It's just kind of included in the management fee, but um, ask what that entails. Are they going to uh, manage and oversee any repairs that need to be done? So if the carpet needs to be replaced and it needs to be painted, do they have people who can do that? It's a big value add for people like you who don't want to kind of manage that. So um, what we do is we, you know, we'll prepare an estimate with a full move out report and we'll kind of determine, hey, this amount's going to be withheld from the tenant. This is the work that needs to be done. Can we just get your approval? We go ahead and handle it. So for somebody that's hands off, um, that's a big value add. So asking them what their process is, uh, if they're able to handle the work, um, that's probably the biggest thing. Because that's, that's just an unexpected expense that if a tenant moves out, you're going to have to likely paint or at least do you know like cleaning if it wasn't left in perfect condition. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of ties back into inspections, right? Yeah. Um, so I am in the middle of a turnover. We had to do an eviction and there's Ooh, going to be wow. a $20,000 uh, turnover. Wow. Yeah. 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 And That's so I, I, I mean, it really comes down to the property manager. There, there was a horrible property manager who didn't do inspections uh and, and that was me <laughs> and so i fired myself and i turned it over to a property manager right and yeah. then and then here we are and um but that was one of the things that i knew i wasn't being good at was inspecting the property and so there's yeah. a chance i feel that if i had done more inspections i could have been either on top of it we could have addressed these things sooner we could have had them move out earlier because yeah. they've been there for like four years um you know and, and just stayed ahead of this and so what is that maybe what's typical for uh, doing yeah. inspections or how much can we negotiate on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Inspections are a great thing to do. Um, and so at a minimum annual inspection um, and the way that we structure it is you know, a couple months, maybe four to five months is about mid lease, but four to five months before the renewal, we'll go in there and do an inspection. So I would recommend at a minimum asking if they're doing an annual inspection. Um, that's kind of the most common thing I've seen because you want to walk the line between uh, we've tried quarterly inspections before, and that, that just frustrates the tenants. Imagine if somebody came in your house quarterly and just scheduling, and they were taking pictures of your stuff. And so you want to be respectful of the tenants because keeping tenants happy keeps them in the house. And so kind of, yeah, walk the line. I'd say probably biannual uh, would be great, and annual at a minimum. So asking what's the process. Do they have a third-party vendor do it? Uh, is it the property manager, your property manager doing it? Uh, and then are they going to provide you a report in photos uh, mm -hmm. with any kind of red flags? that are coming right. out. Um, so that, that that's a super just kind of valuable thing to have. And it gives you peace of mind too. You know, if you aren't going out to the properties, you can see, oh, the tenant hasn't spray painted the walls or there aren't holes in the wall. And, you know, they're, they're keeping it cleaned and maintained. Um, and it's probably just a little bit of a check for tenants. If somebody's coming in and you know that an inspection's coming, I would probably clean up myself. Um, right. And so it's, you know, just once a year, going in there and checking is a really healthy thing. Um, and yeah, so I think that's yeah super important part that I think most are probably going to be an extra charge. Some management companies might do an annual inspection uh, included in management fee. So that would be kind of something to ask in the fee section. Uh, okay. They, they charge for that. Yeah. Yeah. And then so um, along the lines of, you know, the turnover and the maintenance, but also maybe a fee, um, yeah. do they charge for any kind of like maintenance management fee, like yeah. to oversee the, the work that, that may have to be done? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question to ask. So asking kind of along the lines of maintenance, do they have in, you know, they have technicians that are their employees or do they sub out everything? So uh, kind of back to that hundred person is likely not going to have a handyman or a plumber on staff. You just, there's not enough house to support it. Uh, some of the bigger companies do. I mean, we have that, uh, we have technicians. And so just kind of understanding the pros and cons of that um, and asking, yeah, if they do that. So internally, there's not going to be any kind of maintenance management fee. Um, but asking for third parties, uh, I've seen it common to have uh, a 10% management fee. So if you know, maybe the, the bill is 300, there's a 10% fee for your property manager to schedule with the tenant, uh, handle the billing and the invoicing um, for you. So those are two big value that you don't have to think about, but it does cost us, you know, you have to staff up sometimes. Um, and so that's what the cost goes for. It's not a profit, so we're just trying to cover cost a lot of times. Um, but there, you know, we will not do it for some others if that's in the agreement. So asking that, I'd probably say 10% is what I've seen is, is pretty common, uh, if people do have that fee in there. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, and then asking, you know, if there's a renovation, you know, if, if you got that $20,000, is there a fee on top of that to mm -hmm. kind of oversee the project management? 
I'm, with the twenty thousand dollar one, that's just a lot of moving pieces, and so it might be reasonable to just understanding: are they going to charge a fee for that, or is everything subbed out? Uh, yeah, just getting there on the front end when you're kind of budgeting for cash flow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so along the lines of of uh, maintenance, some yeah. folks uh, talk about home warranties. And so how does that play in? Is that frowned upon? Is that encouraged? Uh, how, do, how do potentially home yeah. warranties, first off, maybe give a, a high level of what a home warranty is and then how does that play in with property management? Yeah, great question. So at a high level, like home warranty is, you know, a, you would pay an annual fee. Um, and then basically what that covers is anything that breaks, I guess, anything that's covered at the house, they will handle for a, uh, basically a service charge. Um, so most commonly, I've seen, I don't know what the annual premium on it is, but what I've seen is maybe a $70 charge every single time. So whether it's, you know, cleaning out the sewer main line or it's a small faucet, it's just going to be $70. So you're able in your head, you kind of limit your upside losses, but there is just like a guaranteed cost. And so it might be a water heater that you're able to, to, to get covered for $70. Um, so yeah, that's at a high level it is they cover a lot of the major systems. Um, I'm not a fan of of them I, I think that for a couple of reasons uh, one they're typically really slow to deal with you know really slow to schedule they're not because what they do is they take it and then they sub it out to a number of their vendors and so it just kind of adds a layer of communication um and then yeah so with slow maintenance i mean not, the number one reason that tenants move out of houses is maintenance requests not getting handled and so you want to make sure that maintenance is being handled and home warranties in my experience have just been very slow um, a lot of times, you know, ask if they charge a, a fee for it, you know, um, some property management companies will charge, uh, you know, $30 on top of the 70 that you have to pay to have the home warranty. So, um, ask them through that. And then there's kind of, it's hard to have recourse with the, with the vendor in my experience, because if there is a problem with the repair, so say that my plumber went out there, you would come to me and the responsibility is on me to go fix it. But if it's coming through your property manager to your home warranty company, they've got a number of vendors. There, there just seems to be less responsibility there. So I haven't had tons of luck getting things like callbacks fixed through home warranty. So I, I'm just, I'm typically not a fan. I don't know if they're typically worth it, but if you get you know, an AC unit installed for 70 bucks and you know, kudos to you, you know, that's a great time to use it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, yeah. So what other questions should we be asking? Um, yeah, let's, I mean, hey, we can talk through fees. So I'll kind of go to a high level what fees most management companies charge and okay. uh, we're kind of jump in with questions on what they are. Um, so the, the one that everybody's pretty familiar with is just the management fee. Um, so there's, in the industry, kind of the past couple of years, we've seen a shift from the traditional. So the traditional is 10% of monthly rent into as a fee. So if you rent $2,000, the management fee is $200. Um, so Fees kind of range between eight and 10%. Um, but you, we started to see a lot of this flat fee and we offer some of these flat fee plans. And the thought is it doesn't take me any more to manage an $1,800 home versus a $2,500 home, but on the percentage, I would get a bigger cut of mm -hmm. that. And so that's kind of the thought of where the flat fee model is going. And um, and so, yeah, we offer two of those plans, a couple of other companies do that. So that's that's the most likely thing that you'll see one thing to note on the flat fee plans is they are charged even when it's the house is vacant. So let's say the tenant moves out in June, they don't, the new tenant doesn't move in until the middle of, you know, or the beginning of August, let's say there's 30 days, had to do some repairs. Um, that, that management fee will be charged during that month. And that's part of the part of the way you're getting, able to get the fees a lot lower, um, but just something to kind of be aware of. It's not on rent collected. So that's kind of the high level uh, for that. The next fee is gonna be the leasing fee. So these are gonna be your two biggest expenses. Leasing fees range anywhere from you know, 250 to 100% of, or maybe 200% of one month's rent. Um, I'd say what's typical is probably 50% of one month's rent. So that $2,000 house, you would pay a $1,000 fee. Um, and what does that cover? So that covers um, you know, the cost to screen tenants, the cost to uh, put it on Zillow, the cost to take photos and do inspections and talk with all the prospects and meet them out there. So that's just, a, it's a very labor intensive job. And so that's why the leasing fees uh, is one of the biggest expenses that you'll kind of budget. So um, keeping that in mind, the renewal fee is a lot lower usually. So those range from, you know, it just, you'll have to ask the management company what they are, but they're significantly lower than what the, uh, the leasing fee is. And so it is cheaper and just more profitable to keep tenants in there. So that's my recommendation is to do whatever you can to keep tenants in the houses. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so th those are kind of the three main fees and then some other ones to ask about is maintenance management fee, 
Um, will they charge you a fee? Like, will they pay your HOA? Will they pay your property taxes? Um, you know, will they charge a fee for that? Uh, will they pay your mortgage? You know, yeah, I have seen companies do that. I probably wouldn't recommend that. Um, but yeah, what, what do they charge for that? And then uh, a lot of them listed on their website. So there might be some other fees, but those are kind of like at a high level, the, the main fees you should expect to pay uh, to a property manager. Awesome. Yeah, and I yeah. like that. Uh, that you kind of have, you point out that there's a couple of, because I think when most folks think of property management, it's at 10% fee. Yeah. But there are other fees yeah. along the way, you know, yeah. at different points. And so it's important to understand all those moving parts because last thing we'd want is to sign up with somebody, whatever you, you figure out, nine is the right number, nine percent. Um, but then day one, you're leasing up and you don't get the full uh, full amount you're expecting, right? I mean, that's the last thing anybody would want. So that, that's um, yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah. So along those lines, uh guarantees I, I hear different guarantees with different property yeah. managers and stuff like that so what are some things that they may offer or or uh, yeah. to be asking and thinking about yeah just kind of ask you know what they uh, yeah what things they guarantee i'll kind of run you through ours I, I don't know many other companies um but you know ask well do they have a leasing guarantee is there a certain number of days that they're going to guarantee that they place your tenant in um so that would be the first one and then the maintenance guarantee so what happens if there's a problem you know, plumbers are humans and I'm sure that they make mistakes. And if they're, if a repair is not done correctly, what is the company going to guarantee that they're going to handle? Um, ours is a, you know, your guarantee on all maintenance, third party and internal. And so just ask them what their guarantee is. What are they going to kind of promise to do uh, with, with their maintenance? Um, tenant performance guarantee. So probably talk through, you mentioned an eviction, talk through the scenario. Talk, what is their process? Let's say they move a tenant in and a month later they get evicted. Are you going to be hit with another leasing fee when they place a tenant? Because that right. can be very, very expensive. So ours yeah. is in the first 12 months, we wouldn't re we'd place the tenant and not charge for fee, uh, charge the leasing fee. So just kind of ask that question. You just, again, having as much information on the front end, that way you can make a decision on the back end. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, because if somebody's getting evicted in month one, that sounds like... Uh... The tenant selection was probably a pretty pretty big yeah. mistake and that's yeah. one of the huge reasons you hire a property manager so why should yeah. i have to pay twice because you failed at, at your job so to say so i mean obviously you know things happen right we, yeah. we all know that a lot good. of us have seen tenants you know who look great on paper uh yeah. and then fall on their face uh right away yeah. but yeah i mean yeah. understanding it and and working through all that stuff is uh super important yeah, life happens, man. I've seen a tenant move in and they got divorced and lost their job within two months. And yep. you can control that, but um, at the same time, it, you shouldn't have to pay because that's just a big expense to have back to back. So uh, yeah. I think that, yeah, it's pretty fair. Just not making sure that the agreement's fair. It doesn't have to be a year, um, but just making sure that you guys are on the same page that you know, how the agent, the property manager is going to you know, hold up their end of the bargain of, of the tenant they put in there. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Uh, what else? What, what else? I I feel like we're asking a lot of questions, but I also feel like it's really important to understand all these moving parts. So yeah. what, el what else is on our list here? One thing I would ask about is just preventative maintenance that they do. Um, a lot of companies, this is gonna be an additional fee, but when you're kind of calculating your percentages on what you should have for maintenance, I highly recommend preventative maintenance. It just prevents bigger blowups on the back end. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll kind of walk so through. So what, what does that entail? What could be an example of that? Yeah. So I think inspections kind of fall in that category, just checking the, the condition of the house, uh, maybe an annual or a biannual HVAC and furnace inspection. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as, you know, tenants are told to do something, there's no guarantee that they're going to do it. And changing filters is one of those. So uh, that unfortunately uh, can be a common thing. If a tenant doesn't change their filter, it clogs up the unit. That could be a very costly repair. So um having somebody go to check out maybe in the spring right before it starts to get hot and they start to turn on uh the, the air conditioning the central if they have it again and then the winter uh going out beforehand checking the furnace the last thing you want is one of those first freezes we get and the the, the, the furnace doesn't work it's just a terrible situation for everybody you likely have to pay after hours rates um and so kind of just calculate in your mind if you're just doing things consistently uh, it typically leads to good results so that like checking the furnace and the hvac is one of them, um, and so whether they sum it out and have internal, there's there's a list of things that they'll check and just ask what they are. Um, the next would be um, gutter cleaning. 
This is something big that's in the fall. When leaves fall, well, you don't want to mess with water damage. Uh, this is something big that if gutters are not cleaned out, um, it can water can flow over, it can start to cause water damage in the house, on the exterior of the house, the fascia, soffit, et cetera. So uh, having the gutters cleaned on a consistent basis is uh, a really healthy thing. And then sprinkler blowouts in Colorado, we have a lot of sprinklers uh, with this dry climate. So making sure they're being blown out before any of the first freezes of the year and then making sure they're being turned on. That way we can have green grass in the summer. Um, and then aeration and fertilization of the yard, you wanna make sure you're taking care of the yard. Uh, we don't expect our tenants to do that. We do expect them to cut the yard. Um, but maybe doing a spring cleanup for them is a benefit to the tenant um, and just kind of yeah setting it up setting them up for success where they can just cut the yard and making sure that your sprinklers work uh, and that kind of stuff if you have those so um, those and a couple other ones might be a sewer line clean out so uh, with a lot of these clay pipes you get roots that grow through there um, sewer backups are expensive we you know they could range in the ten thousand dollar if they're getting on carpet and destroying walls and uh, and that kind of stuff so We've got some owners that we go out there and twice a year we'll just uh, run a cable down it and make sure the lines are clear. So, um, and then water tank, water heater flushes. Um, so sediment builds up at the bottom of these water heaters uh, and it can cause them to fail earlier. So if you flush them consistently, um, it can get the sediment out of there. It can prevent, uh, you know, that sediment for getting in lines and clogging up stuff. So uh, those are most of the ones that we do for owners. There's probably some other random one-offs, but Ask them what they charge for those. Usually they have a flat fee or an agreed upon fee that they've got with the vendor. Uh, but I would highly, highly recommend to budget those uh, into just your kind of your, your matrix when you're running your numbers because it saves you so much money in the back end. You know, yeah. sending something out there paying $100, $150 to check your furnace is better than the after hour rate or, or if they just, you know, they don't change the, the filter for a year. Um, yeah, it, it, catching those on the front end is, yeah, a, a very wise thing to do in my opinion. I love it. What else yeah. should we be talking to uh, to our property managers about? Um, asking, yeah, about, uh, let's see, contract link, um, kind of understand the front end. What If things go bad, can I get out of my contract or am I locked in? Um, you know, I certainly don't want to do this with people I don't trust and don't like, and so if that ever happens, with you, you would want to make sure that you just know the front end. Some will... Uh, have a year-long contract, some have month-to-month -month contract. Understand what that is. Um, they're, they're kind of right wrong. It's just different for every management company. Uh, understand what that is, what you're kind of you know, putting pen on paper to is like really important. Yeah, uh, because obviously you're going to be talking through, I would hope, you know, and, and this list of questions probably covers a lot of what's in that contract, but it's yeah. you got to read through it because it's a way yeah. to you know, spot check and make sure you're not just uh, with someone who's trying to tell you the, the right thing is to get you to sign. No, you got to make yeah. sure you fully understand it. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, yeah, another thing, what happens, yeah, when somebody goes on vacation, hey, everybody needs time off. It's a healthy thing. Does the does the show, show stop when they go to Mexico for a week? Uh, yeah. Or do they have a system of process? Who kind of owns the backup uh, on that? So just yeah, understanding that uh, is, is probably a pretty healthy thing. Cool. I'm um, looking through my list. So, yeah, what, what, other, what other questions? Yeah. Um, and so let's say we get through this this list. Wow. Uh, we're having a good conversation. Everything feels good. You're happy with, um, you know, with their retention rates. You understand how long they're going to be, um, and how they renew tenants, and how you know you're talking through, you know, tenant success. I guess right. How many evictions do they have, and what does that look like, and all these other moving parts. And you're like, okay, let let's do it. Um. What what is the next step from there? Um, next step for a lot of companies is uh, probably an inspection. Uh, meeting somebody out of the home, understand you know, kind of going through the condition, uh, seeing if there are repairs on the front end. So that next step would be getting any repairs done, getting your house ready to be rented. Uh, the management company, if you know they've got a maintenance division, should be able to help out with that. Um, okay. And then probably signing the contract, and then that's when the ball really starts to roll. And so that's when you can kind of take your hands off and kind of get it over to the property managers. That's when they will start to list the property. Uh, they will start to take prospective tenants, you know, process them, sign the lease. And so that's that's really the main step. So it's it, it will probably get very slow while you're searching for property managers. And once you find the right one, things should take off and things should happen pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. And then so, I, you know, looking over the notes that we were trading, it looks like we call that uh, onboarding, right? Yeah. Where we actually get started. So. Uh, is there anything else we would need to know about the onboarding process, actually getting started and, and turning over a property to them? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think just setting clear expectations is really important, um, kind of understanding the timeline. What I would recommend is setting up like a weekly or a monthly call in the beginning. Uh, this kind of does serves two purposes. One, it fills you in on what's going on and it doesn't require you to constantly be checking your email because if you know that you have the weekly call coming up, that's when your communication is going to happen. But that, that's just part of building the relationship. It's just building that trust. So maybe while your property is leasing, um, you know, if that's not already in their process, ask them to do that. Have a weekly call. But that also forces them to make sure on a weekly basis they are prepared and they're up to date because they're going to have to you know, be held accountable for kind of the work that they did the past week. So that would just be a big tip. I'm, it's just like really successful when people do do that. You don't have to. Um, but that's what I would probably do because it just builds a comfortability level of on a weekly basis, you're walking through, okay, wh what did you guys do last week? Uh, anything I should be aware of? Are there any changes to the price that we need to make? Is there any maintenance issues that I need to handle? At least touching on it once a week. Um, as long as it's priced correctly, you shouldn't have those calls for too long if, if the property manager's uh, priced it correctly and is marketing it correctly. Um, but that, yeah, that'll just lead to success. It'll develop you a lot of trust and that way they place a tenant you can really be hands off and you can focus on buying more properties. You can focus on you know, whatever else you want to be focusing on uh, because that's what we're here for. We're to take things off of owners' hands. Um, that's all property managers should be doing. We should be making people's lives easier and not harder. Yeah. Yeah, ex <laughs> I, I like that. Um, I think a lot of folks, you know, especially the folks I work with, you know, in the coaching and the consulting world, um, yeah. the highest and best use of their time is not managing their property. You know, this yeah. is, this is an investment for them, just like their yeah. stock portfolio or whatever that may be. And so the highest and best use of their time isn't sitting there in E-Trade all day, every day, right? Managing yeah. their stock portfolio. So it, in some respects, it's the same thing with managing their, their rental portfolio. Yeah. And so you hire the professional, they do their job, you set up the, the understand the communication. Uh, yeah. and, and then the highest and best use of your time is whatever, running your small business, running your fix and flip business, you know, whatever, yeah. just having your day job. I mean, whatever that is, that's probably the highest and best use of their time. Um, where the highest and best use of your time is doing a great job of tenant selection and managing properties, you know, and, yeah. and handling these maintenance requests to yeah. reduce the, the turnover. And so that's, yeah. that's really what it comes down to, right? What we're trying to do is hire the professional to do the things that I don't want to or need to be focusing yeah. on because that's not the highest and best use of my time. That's it, man. Even if you get one property, I think it's worth it to just have a third party to it. And they also like, we, we can bring an objectivity to it. Um, I think a lot of times what we see is owners can get emotional. Maybe this is the house that, I don't know, the first house you bought, or, you know, it was the house your kids grew up in. And so then they're trying to rent it out. And it's really hard to be objective uh, and maybe make decisions about tenants that you place um, or even about collecting rent. I mean, I think it's one thing we didn't touch on. Um, you know, it, a lot of people are just, they, they, they hear a lot of excuses and you might have a big heart and you just allow tenants to continually pay late. Um, but that can get you into some trouble and that can develop bad habits for the tenant. So I think just separating yourself, one, from a uh, legality standpoint, fair housing, that you let somebody else do that. But two, letting them collect the rent, letting them make maintenance decisions, uh, I think will kind of probably yeah, lead to a better result if you're not kind of clouded with emotion um, about, oh, that was, you know, you know, wh whatever it may be, uh, I think this is a really helpful thing to separate and let a professional handle that for you. Yeah, I, I love it. And yeah. so we're coming towards the end of our hour together. Um, and there's kind of been a big theme here of communication. It seems yeah. like communication is really important. Yeah. Uh, and so, well, what if we do, we've, we've gone through the list, we've found one that we like, uh, yeah. we hired them, we signed the contract, we went through the onboarding process, uh, we're off to the races. But then there's an issue. Something yeah. comes up and we feel like we're, we're just not seeing eye to eye. What may be some of the things that we should uh, we should talk about and, and understand and work through when it comes to that, when we're having issues, not with the tenant, but with the property manager? Yeah, it was it was interesting. I was on uh, bigger pockets. I saw somebody just kind of asking for a recommendation for a new property management company. So you kind of read through and it sounded like there was an issue with rent collection and it sounded like rent had been collected. Um, so I just asked a question. I think kind of what we got down to is he didn't like the way that they communicated, but this person hadn't yet told the property management company. It was just kind of eye-opening. Uh, you go through all this work to find, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, getting coffee and asking like all these questions and you do all this work. And this guy was ready to pull the plug. Um, initially, I think it's just all business relationships. It was probably miscommunication on what the process was. Now, property managers are humans and they're probably going to screw up. So what I would recommend is first talk. This this guy didn't talk to his management company. It was just going to kind of change. And so 
talk through, understand, are you misunderstanding something from a process standpoint? Um, maybe you're just not seeing something or maybe they screwed up. And if they screwed up, you know, hear them out, hear what happened, what's their plan to fix it. Um, and then maybe from a comfortability, kind of go back to that weekly phone call if you need to develop that. Um, you don't want to have to manage your property manager, but I think if, you know, if there are big problems or at the beginning, it's probably a healthy thing. So it's just conflict resolution. Just talk through issues with them. Um, you know, we're people, you know, we, we make mistakes, but we also have enough to it. We'll put our money where our mouth is if we did. Um, so yeah, just, I think that's just a very healthy thing. You can probably ask if it's a bigger company, maybe ask change property managers within there. Um, I've seen that work. Maybe it's you lost trust with somebody, but um, you still like the company and their processes. Maybe asking for a new point of contact to build that relationship would be a healthy thing. I think just a last resort, just uh, terminating a management company, but just because from the brain damage from you, it takes to change over all of that, um, just keeping things as simple as possible. But the good thing is there's a lot of great managers out here. So if things do go bad, you do pick a bad one. There are tons of other ones out there who can be able to help you out. Uh, but just try, yeah, try and talk through things, just try and troubleshoot and understand um yeah what their processes are was their process issue maybe you don't like their process and just ask them can you change this process in the future um you know it kind of goes back to that agent showing versus self-showing thing maybe you you know maybe you were at the house and somebody came in the house and you weren't expecting that and that's just kind of a process understanding if that's going to happen or not so um yeah bring that up to your property manager give them the opportunity to fix it um see if it's a process change that you can live with um if they're able to make that and accommodate for you hopefully they are uh, and things get better from there. But um, yeah, just kind of work through things and understand the process is really helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. Well, yeah. that's about, well, one, the end of our hour together. And then two, the list of questions I kind of had for you. So, um, but before we wrap up, I just want to throw it out there to all the attendees of the webinar. If you have any questions, now is the chance. Jump into that question section. Nobody's really been too active in there yet. Um, but now is certainly the time. You know, we've got a property manager, lots of experience. Now's the time to reach out, ask some questions. Um, I, I think you got a few more minutes to hang out with us, I, I hope. And so if yeah. anybody's got those questions, jump on in. Going once, maybe somebody's typing. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah. you know, as as uh, as we're wrapping up, if anybody is typing away, I just want to offer that I've put together a pretty comprehensive list of questions to be asking and interviewing uh, property managers. I'm certainly going to be incorporating uh, the ones that we've been talking about. Um, and so understanding, so if anybody on the call, um, and of course we're going to record this and put it on YouTube. And so if anybody watching on YouTube in the future wants to get a copy of those questions, you know, feel free and give me a call, shoot me an email. Um, happy to pass that list on um, yeah. to make sure that we're all, you know, having good conversations. Uh, Cause like, you know, Gray was saying, that's the most important part is having good communication. And so obviously that starts up front as we are communicating back and forth. Um, uh, and most importantly, at the very beginning when we're interviewing property managers. Well, I don't see any questions popping up. So, uh, you know, great. What's the best way for someone to get a hold of you in case uh, an idea pops in their head over the night or tomorrow or, you know, in six yeah. months? Yeah, happy to talk. No pressure. If you just have any property management questions, kind of reach out to me. Um, yeah, best way to get uh, probably by email, uh, gray.hall at gkhouses.com. It's G R A Y dot hall at gkhouses.com. Uh, or, uh, yeah, car office uh, website. You get our website, you can get our office number on there. Uh, and you can reach me there. Beautiful. And so there is a question that popped up. Um, what do you think about corporate rentals? Corporate rentals. Um, we get asked to do those occasionally. I don't know much about it, truthfully. Um, you know, that, that's a uh, people that hear property management. This is probably good. I mean, it's we do residential, so that's what we focus on. It's just putting residents in there for kind of long term leases, 12 months typically. Um, and then you have maybe your short term furnished rentals, which is kind of the corporate world. And so these might be contracts with companies. We don't do a ton of that. Um, it's just a different process. You're, you know, you're probably maybe having a lease with a company versus a, an individual person. Um, and then you have, you know, vacation rental and you kind of have Airbnb. Um, and then maybe even rent by the room is another category that I've seen kind of come up. And so of those five, you know, we focus on this. And so that would be a whole other property manager. Um, so yeah, I don't really truthfully know too much about that. I'm not going to ask for that, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. Yeah, but I think that's a great point is, yeah. you know, in the, the big picture of property management, there's yeah. different levels, different expertise, right? And so you're more of the single family, maybe multifamily, right? Maybe small yeah. apartments, uh, but the corporate 
corporate uh, rentals is a whole different animal. Short-term right. rentals is a whole different animal. And there may be some companies that are, that are good at both, um, but maybe <laughs> there's not. And so, you know, ask around and really understand yeah. what their expertise is. I think that's awesome. Yeah, great question. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if there's anything I can do, if you need hard money, of course, Pine Financial Group would love to talk to you and work with you. Uh, if you need some hand-holding and getting your uh, rental business up and running, I'd love to chat with you uh, in regards to that. So reach out anytime. You can find me at justin at pinefinancialgroup.com and our office phone number is 303-835-4445. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Appreciate the time tonight. And we'll see you next month on the next webinar. Thanks, Justin.